Hello and welcome at Book Lovers Companion. My name is Edith and right next to me is my lovely co-host, The Chattering Teacup. Hello. And here with us, author of the debut novel, The Love You Know, Elena Lyons. Elena, hello and welcome at Book Lovers Companion. Hello and thank you. It's a pleasure to have you on our show. And like I said, The Love You Know, your first novel, which is very fresh from the printers. It came out in January yes. this year. It came out. So the first version came out in July of last year mm -hmm. and then I republished it. Mm -hmm to Amazon. It came out on Barnes & Noble last year. We published it to Amazon J January of this year. Mm. Uh -huh. I see. Okay. Not so fresh then. It's, uh, <laughs> somewhat fresh. It's still somewhat fresh. <laughs> <laughs> um, tell us about your book. I mean, your main character, Odette, is the first person narrator in the story. She works yes. for the fire department and she has a lot going on in her personal life. Not so much in her professional life, but it's a, mainly about her uh, private life. Tell us about Odette. Yeah, so that's very accurate, a good, a good description. Um, she is a firefighter, but the story follows her, um, her personal choice between two people that she loves and trying to figure out what's best for her in a situation that she see, sees as impossible. So it kind of follows that journey for her. Mm -hmm. And you are a voluntary firefighter yourself. I am. Ah, so you took the, the professional part when you tell us about her professional life. You took a lot from there as well? Yeah, I mean, a lot of people, it's funny, when I published the book, I had a lot of people that I know who asked me if it was based on my life. And I was like, if my life was that dramatic, don't you think you would know about it? <laughs> Come on. Like, it would be great if my life was like that. I mean, wow. But you no, know, it's, but it, what's funny is that it, when you're, cause I was there before I, you know, now I'm, like I said, I'm six months pregnant, but um, before that um, I was there 24 hours every third day mm -hmm. and you just absorb, mm -hmm. you know, bits of conversations and people's lives and you get to know all these different people. And it just, If you, I think if you have a certain kind of brain, you just turn it into like story mode. Like I can put all of this together. And it kind of became like a, um, this like amalgam of <laughs> stories mm -hmm. that became one story, which is Odette's. But, um, but yeah, I definitely drew on, um, being a firefighter, I kind of drew on that atmosphere because it, it was mm -hmm. like home to me. So it just mm -hmm. made sense to like, I'll set it here. So, mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. And the decision to write this book um, in the first person, um, was it there from the start? No, it actually, I wrote, I started this novel three different times mm. and I deleted the first two. Um, the first one was third person um, and it just didn't feel, it didn't feel personal enough to tell her story like that mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. it felt like I was an intruder in her life. And this felt like a very personal, this felt like almost like a diary. Like it felt mm -hmm. like this is what someone is not willing to tell anybody, mm -hmm. but they'll write it down in a diary. And that's kind of what mm -hmm. I wanted it to feel like. Mm -hmm. um, Cause I've always been someone who writes, I've, I have tons of journals and my entire life I've written, like, you know, if I'm feeling something, I'll just write it down. And I think I wanted to convey that sense of that. You're kind of like, you're kind of like the diary. Like mm -hmm. the reader is kind of mm -hmm. like, The diary for her they're the sounding board mm -hmm. so you're not there to judge her or kind of um I guess you can if you want you're the reader you can do whatever you want but <laughs> you, you know that role is kind of supposed to be um just there like a fly on the wall you're mm -hmm. watching it unfold mm -hmm. can't tell her can't give her advice mm -hmm. but you're there to see it so I think first person once I started writing it that way it just felt so much more organic mm -hmm. and natural Because it was like, this is how it's supposed to be told. This is how it yeah. makes sense for her. Mm -hmm. And did it feel more intimate for you to write it in this first person, especially these all these relationship uh, problems um, compared to third person? Yes, it definitely did. It kind of felt like, I think when you write with the characters, they kind of become your friends in a mm -hmm. way. It's, it's kind of like you have this relationship with them. That sounds very weird, but it, like mm -hmm. it's kind of like you have this relationship mm -hmm. with them. And it definitely did feel more intimate, kind of like in this weird fictional way, she was trusting me to tell the story, like, you know, in that, in that kind of a sense. So I feel like that 
using first person was definitely a choice that I think made a lot of sense. And looking back on like the first version that was third person, I don't think it would have had the same emotional impact Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. because it would have felt like even just a little bit more remote and detached. And I think that would have kind of taken away from it a little bit. Mm -hmm. And reading your your book, I sometimes felt a little, just a tiny bit like, you know, this little devil on her shoulder. She she herself was was the angel, <laughs> and I felt a little bit like the devil on her shoulder, telling her, "Oh please, no, no, we're not going to do that. No, 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 bad." <laughs> was- no, that that makes a lot of sense. That makes a lot of sense, and I think what's funny is that there were moments where I was actively rooting against what I was writing. I was like, <laughs> "I don't want her to do this. <laughs> this I don't want her to make this choice." But I felt like this was way it was supposed to be. And I, I desperately did not want for her to be 100% likable because I think that's so unrealistic. And I think Mm -hmm. there's some books where the character is just always making the right choice Mm -hmm. doing the Mm -hmm. right thing. And even Mm -hmm. if they do the wrong thing, they turn around and then they do the right thing. And that's not humans. Mm -hmm. People sometimes do bad things Mm -hmm. and then they don't fix it. They keep doing bad things over and over again. They keep making mistakes. Sometimes they learn from them and sometimes they don't. And I wanted the reader to be able to empathize with her without placing judgment on Mm -hmm, her. mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So kind of saying, wow, she's making a lot of bad decisions here. There are kind of reasons for them, though. There's Mm -hmm. if you look back at like she's been through this and she's experienced this and she's in this place. But it's it's funny because I'm writing. I'm actually writing the sequel now. Mm. And I'm kind of taking it into this whole new level of maybe the reasons run out, Mm -hmm. you know, maybe, Mm -hmm. yeah, she's got this past and it's hard for her and all this stuff, but maybe eventually, when do you stop blaming it on that and start Mm -hmm. saying, okay, I'm just, I'm just doing these things. Why am I doing these things? Maybe you have to look at it present instead of past tense. Mm -hmm. I mean, it felt a little bit like she was on a train without a, a person who was able to stop the train. Yeah. Yeah. And Like you said, I mean, the events in her past, which we learn about uh, while we read the book, I mean, it's not only her past that makes her, um, I don't know, make the wrong choices, but also her husband, Avery. He's also Mm -hmm. been impacted by what happened in the past. And maybe because he's he's a man uh, who can't express himself that well, if he ever could express himself that way. Um, communication stopped between the two of them. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. Uh, s- slowly more like uh, at the end of the book, they start communicating again. Yeah. But during the book, although they w- they are in, 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 in therapy, they don't seem to find a way to communicate what's going on because a lot also Odette's feelings, they all happen in her in her mind. I think they both have pushed themselves in different mm. corners yeah, and they don't know how to yeah. get out of them. Yeah. And that's very difficult. I think then, then you need someone else who kind of yeah. takes you and shakes you or something and um, forces you to reconsider. Yeah. yeah. And I think in her case too, and I think for both of them, she was, she had so many internal thoughts mm. about Avery and about what was going on, but she, she herself didn't communicate them. Yep. She thought them and yep. she, you know, in some way told the therapist about them, but she, she kept blaming Avery for not communicating with her and she wasn't communicating either. Yep. So she was thinking all this stuff and she had all these big feelings, but she wasn't telling them to him. How was he supposed to know? Yep. And vice versa. You know, yep. he wasn't even trying to communicate with her and, and feel what she was feeling. Mm. So I think they both, it's like you said about being pushed into different corners. It's like they both were just stuck. Mm-hmm. It's like they were marching in place <laughs> and they were not going anywhere. Yeah, I think true. At one point they stopped realizing that they're not communicating. Mm. They may think they do, but they don't. Yeah. Yeah, true. yeah. And I would also say, I mean, it wasn't lightly. Let's, let's not call it lightly. But the easier way out for her? Did she choose the easier way out? In a in a way, maybe. I don't know. In my opinion, she did choose mm-hmm. the easier way out. I've had a, different people have t- told me different things. And there's like, oh, well, you know, 
Um, I wish that she had done the opposite. I wish that she had, you know, why did she do that? Or, or I agree with her that she did that. You know, she did the right thing. But for her, I think, I think she did the right thing for the wrong reasons. Mm-hmm. So it kind of negates it being the mm-hmm. right thing. You yeah. know, it kind of is, you know, yes, she she did the quote unquote right right thing in the end. But I think she she did what was easier mm-hmm. at the time for her. But I think it's, in, it's more realistic that way because mm-hmm. I think in reality it happens more often that way. And I think most, let's say, books about relationships usually start with people meeting each other, falling in love with each other, and then living happily ever after. But um, <laughs> all, most people, I think, at some point end in a situation that is a bit similar, where it's become difficult to communicate, where um, work requirements work against mm. your relationship and so That's on. And, and yeah, it's, problems mean, start to arise. Yeah, not all of them together, but <laughs> yeah. one or the yeah. other. Yeah. And your book, I mean, although it's called The Love You Know, it's not a romance in the usual way. It's not. <laughs> but it's about it's love. kind of like a taboo. <laughs> it's kind of like a taboo romance. Yeah. I, and the thing is, like, I, there's so many, it's like exactly, exactly like you said, there's so many books where, you know, um, one person meets the other person and they fall in love and then something happens and then they break up and then they find each other at the end. Mm-hmm. And so little is talked about with, infidelity Mm -hmm. because it's it's so taboo even Mm -hmm. you know it's 2023 and it's still very much like oh my god we'll talk about it and I wanted to kind of shine a light on it in a way that was very real and non-judgmental non-judgmental but also just showed like these are two human beings these are two people three people if you count um Avery and four if you count Parker's wife you know these are these are people who have real relationships real feelings and they're making real choices. And it's kind of like, how do you navigate yeah. when you're, when this is in your face? And this mm-hmm. is, and I've had some people who've actually said, well, I don't want to read it because it's about adultery or I don't want to read. And I'm like, well, but this is a fact of life. This is a real yeah. thing that happens like in yeah. relationships. This, this happens. And I would kind of, you know, argue that in a lot of relationships, this happens, whether we want to admit it or not. Yeah. So it's it's kind of that you kind of something that you can shy away from it or you can talk about it. And I, I kind of like talking about stuff that other people aren't talking about. <laughs> you know, I kinda of like being the ones like, hey, here it is in your face. But, it's it, it's yeah. also, I mean, uh, like you said, how you salvage your life, your your other relationships, your working relationships as well, how how you navigate mm-hmm. through this kind of uh private Problems uh, connected with uh, professional problems because um, she found she found that the person she had an affair with not outside of work it was a colleague of hers. I, I hope we are allowed to say that. I mean, it's, yeah. so it's right at the beginning of your book, so it's it's double complicated for her I mean, in you, a way. Yep, you spend so much time at yep. work. Yeah, there's a different connection yep. with your colleagues than if you maybe spend eight hours or yep. nine hours a day with yep. each other. It's, Different, I guess. Yeah. Yeah, especially, yeah, like you said, I mean, they spent 24 hours a day with each other and then she would go home and spend very little time with Avery. They had very little connection. So it kind of it makes sense that if there's um if there's a little hole in the in the wall, all you have to do is hit it a few more times and mm-hmm. it'll come crashing down. Like there's already a breach. And did she do anything to stop it? No. But yeah. she she just kind of walked through. But at the same time, there was a weakness there that was obvious. I mean, it was just obvious that that would, that would happen. And I think she was looking, she was looking for something without realizing it. Mm-hmm. You know, I think in her portrayal of it, I think the, the narrator is supposed to be, Odette is supposed to kind of say like, Oh, well, I didn't want this to happen, you know, but in a way I think she had a did want it to happen. And I think you see that through her actions mm-hmm. that she didn't, maybe she didn't actively, you know, consciously want it to happen, but subconsciously she was not trying to stop it. Mm-hmm. So I think she was kind of actively playing a part in her own self-destruction in a way. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah. I mean, uh, what you said, Tika, I mean, it's interesting. You have to, usually those those books, those romantic books where love is mentioned in the title and in the book itself, people meet each other and then happily ever after, which we all know uh, sometimes it is, sometimes it's not, uh, which reminded yeah. me of a play by Ephraim Kishon. Mm, it's a comedy. Uh, but it's about Romeo and Juliet. So Romeo mm. and Juliet didn't die, 
and it's their 50th anniversary. And they're constantly at each other's throats. And yeah, well, <laughs> they have a daughter who, who is a problem for them and so on. And their life is not all roses, you know? Picture perfect, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's fun. It's a comedy. But it's a bit, like you said, it's, it's relatable in a way because you all know it's not always roses and so on. Because real life uh, tends to happen this annoying habit of getting in the way of our lives like mm -hmm. we yep. would and, want them and everyday to be. life often is simply done <laughs> exactly and you said yep. some people or readers might not like Odette I didn't found her not likable I mean she was relatable and she wasn't uh, how shall I put it I mean I was a bit neutral towards her let's put it that way Uh, like I said, I was. Uh, you you are in her head. You are on her shoulder during the book, and you think, oh, "Why did you do it?" And like you said, there was a lot of uh, thinking on her side, not uh, feelings that weren't expressed. And he always yeah. wanted to tell her, "Oh, please, just uh, say it out loud. Yeah. It might help." And what was a bit my uh, my point of view as a reader? Oh. Uh, Or a, a strange feeling I had was towards Parker. I have to admit it. I'm honest here. Hmm. I was uh, somehow I was I was waiting for the big reveal of his personality. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, some some sort of not so nice guy, <laughs> to be honest. Which he's not. I mean, uh, he's a uh, hmm. In in the end, I mean, you you get his uh, his motives, why he does what he does, or why he doesn't do what he he sh maybe in in Odette's uh, mind should have done. But you get him in a way, yeah, yeah. Yeah, but I think <laughs> most people are somewhere in between. They mm. they they seem nice and friendly and so on. Then maybe they sometimes do or say something like, "What really." Why? And and then they're nice again. So it's yeah. they're people and mm. they no are heroes. kind of multidimensional kind of way and exactly. That, that's what makes them interesting. That's what yeah. makes the whole book interesting because like you said before, I mean it's more relatable. It's real. We have real people here you talk about. And Not some And some things they do, yeah. I think they really understand and say, okay, yeah, mm. that's the way it is. Mm. Maybe not everything, but mm. everyone, yeah. get, I guess everyone will say that about something else. Yeah, but yeah, true. Yeah. And I think it would have been, in his case, I think he he struggled just as much as she did, yeah. but in a very different way. Yeah. Because I don't think, for him, I don't think the decision he made was something he came to lightly. I think he definitely went back and forth a lot about it. And I feel like there's, when you're reading his part of it, I feel like it'd be easy to go back and forth with whether you like him or not, because, you know, he, he's so good for her and he's so good to her. But then at the same time, he's, he doesn't appear to be struggling like she is. Yeah. Like he might be internally, but he plays it off like he's not. So that kind of makes him seem kind of like a villain in a way, <laughs> because he's, You know, you hear him talking to his wife and, and lovey-dovey yeah. and all this stuff. And and I don't know, I kind of felt for her a little bit. Mm. I kind of felt like, and I, I purposely did not want to have his wife play a big part in it. I wanted mm -hmm. her to be, because if if you're in Odette's shoes, when are you actually going to meet the wife? Yep. Probably <laughs> never. So I wanted it to be like, you have to really try to think about, okay, he's married, he's in this mm. situation. What, how does his wife feel about this? How's like, he, are they okay? Like, what's the situation there? So I kind of wanted it to be like, you are in her shoes, seeing the world as she sees it. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, from her point of view, probably that there are, there are moments when I thought, um, what is she thinking? I mean, what can she think? She doesn't know anything about yeah. this part of him, this side of him. So for yeah. her, it's probably all's good. Unless she and I, I don't out. think she, I don't think she wanted to either. Mm. Yeah, yeah, true. I also, mm. I also wanted to ask you. I mean, we do not want to give too much away, of course, but it's like we said, it's not the usual romance, but it's also a 
about loss, grief, and coping with grief. And still at the end of the book, I think they haven't coped with their grief, have they? I don't I don't think so. And I think that kind of I think that kind of comes out in the second one a little bit more. Mm-hmm. Cause I wanted to end it in a way where you really didn't know what was going to, mm-hmm. what was that going to happen with them? But they, they didn't, that's the thing is that they, they kind of went back into their lives. They just kind of dropped themselves right back in and they didn't resolve anything. They didn't fix anything. No, but as the title says, the love, you know, um, it's what she knows. Mm. And I think mm-hmm. some, I mean, sometimes people choose what they know instead of the unknown because mm-hmm. it feels safer. Mm. Yeah, and often people realize sometimes too late what they had mm. because it's not not so bad what you have because only the new things look more enticing, mm. even if they aren't true. Yeah, and I think she, I think in her case, having it's like you said, it was it's it was comfortable. Like she mm. picked what was comfortable, and yeah. and it ended up I think for both of them being like you know like a like a cushy chair. You know, <laughs> they got right back into into mm-hmm. what felt what felt comfortable for them. Yeah, yeah, that, that's true. And I also wanted to ask you a little bit, since we touched upon that, I wanted to ask a little bit about this background of her professional life. <laughs> Are firefighters really that childish? <laughs> Are they that childish? Yes. <laughs> um, <laughs> firefighters are overgrown children in every in every way i mean you have to be in order to do that for a living but yes they they are that childish <laughs> absolutely 100 <100%. laughs> okay i mean what we forget most of the time the job that they do it's a hard job i yeah. mean they see a lot of bad things a lot of blood and a lot of violence probably and it's hard to cope so it's it's their mm-hmm. way also of coping yeah, it's it, that's definitely true, and I learned that early on. What I remember when I um I got my first very difficult call, and um I was taking it a lot harder than everybody else was. Mm. And as soon as we were back to the station, everybody was like, "Oh yeah, what's for dinner? What are we gonna do?" Like <laughs> making jokes, and I was like, "How are you guys okay? Like I'm I'm try like I'm on the verge of tears. I was traumatized. Mm-hmm. Like this is really scary." And they were like, this is, "You're gonna see it again. It's gonna happen again. You know, mm. you just have to keep going." Mm-hmm. And eventually like I, I definitely learned that and I think that's another thing that makes it easy to I don't want to say stray because that's a cliche word but if you're already in this mental state where you're you experience a lot of bad things over and over mm-hmm. and over again and then you there's this one person that's like your pillar and your rock that helps you mm-hmm. feel better mm-hmm. you're gonna just go straight toward that because you especially in that environment where you're, there's nothing else that really feels good. You know, mm-hmm. you're, so you, you latch onto your people, whoever they are, and you just hold on to them for your life. And I think that's kind of what, what happened here too. Mm-hmm. I mean, in your private life, you have to look for help on your own. Like Avery did in this case, because he wanted to save the marriage, what they had. Mm-hmm. But what about the professional life? Like you said, your first experience you had, Everyone else just went making dinner and what's for dinner. But do people like firefighters or policemen or whatever, do they get professional help without asking for it? Without asking for it. That's interesting. Um, I think it's a lot better than it used to be. I think there's a lot of resources now. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's not as frowned upon. I think years ago it was very frowned upon mm-hmm. because it was a, it's a, still a very male-dominated field. And yeah. I think it's that's that stigma of like, well, you, you know, this is your job and you Mm -hmm. were to be strong. And, but I think now there's, there's a lot of, like, I know someone in the department who he's very active with mental health, Mm -hmm. um, mental health stuff in the, in the department. And he is constantly a resource for people telling people it's okay to talk about stuff. Mm -hmm. And so it's becoming a lot more normalized Mm -hmm. to, Mm -hmm. I mean, is it mainstream? Not yet, but Mm -hmm. it's becoming a lot more normalized to talk about, even if it's just at, at the dinner table, Mm -hmm. just like, wow, that was, that was a really tough call we went on. That was, you know, just talking about it makes a difference Mm -hmm. instead of going about your day, like nothing happened. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. 
Now, what I, mean, what I meant before when I said without asking for it, uh, what I meant is um, a routine supervision hours or something like that. Not that I'm aware of, no. Yeah. I mean, if, <laughs> so if, if something happens, like a line of duty death or something like that, there's people who will automatically come out to mm -hmm. the stations and talk mm -hmm. to everybody mm -hmm. um, and say, you know, these are the resources available, this is a really difficult time. But you can't possibly do that for every difficult call. Mm -hmm. I mean, because... You see stuff every every day. You see something else that's, you know. So mm -hmm. and calls are difficult to different reasons for different people. So mm -hmm. yeah. you know, maybe you have a patient who reminds you of a close friend or a family member, mm -hmm. and you lose that patient, and it triggers something in you. Yeah. Whereas for your partner, they're perfectly fine because they don't have that. So yeah, you know. But mm -hmm. um, yeah. if you want it, there's someone that you know you can go to if you need help. I think that's an improvement. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah absolutely. Yeah. And so, um, I said before, it's your debut novel, although it's not completely fresh, not warm anymore uh, from the printers, but still your first novel. Um, tell us a little bit about the start of getting into writing a novel. What, f when, when, how, when did it start for you? So I have written my entire life. I have a degree in English. Um, and I have always, as long as I can remember, I've been writing, but I've never before this, I was never able to push past a short story. Mm -hmm. I always, I've wrote, I've written a ton of short stories, <clears throat> but I never was able to develop it to a point where I was like, this is going to be a full fledged novel. And I always wanted to write a novel, but there was never something that was big enough that mm -hmm. could do it. And then this one, I just started writing and I think this was about three years ago now I just started writing and I was like this could be something bigger than just a short story I feel like there's a lot to say here um and I was so like shocked with it because I just kept <laughs> writing and there kept being more stuff to say I was like oh my god this is happening um and now I find it a lot easier now it's like that unlocked something and I'm mm -hmm. just I can sit and write and I think it, I think you have to like rip the bandaid off. Like if there's something that, <laughs> mm -hmm. you know, yep. like I was so, I think I couldn't write that novel because I was so, I had it in my mind that it had to be mm -hmm. a novel, mm -hmm. but this one, I didn't have expectations for it. I just mm -hmm. started writing and then it, mm -hmm. you know, so came put, to be what it was. Yeah. Putting less pressure on yourself then. Trying uh, to. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Why not? I mean, and the challenges in writing this novel. I suppose there have been some. What were the greatest challenges writing this book? I think hitting those spots where she, the character could go one of two ways and trying to figure out which way you want them to mm -hmm. go. Mm -hmm. Because I never, I try so hard not to make decisions based on what I think the reader would want to read. Mm -hmm. And sometimes I think I got caught in that a little bit. I'm like, well, it would probably attract more readers if this if he said this, or if mm -hmm. this happened. And there's so many like one liners in typical romance novels that the, you know, <laughs> the guy says to the woman, and it's like, it's hard not to fall into that sometimes. Um, but I really didn't want it to be like, I kept telling myself whether this sells or not, I want it to mm -hmm. be what I want it to be. I want mm -hmm. it to be truthful to what it's supposed to be versus um, pandering. And, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, I, cause I just didn't want it to be like that. Um, so I think the hardest part of it was trying to make it as organic as possible mm -hmm. and not letting it kind of become a cliche. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And staying, in a, in and staying true to yourself. Yeah. 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 And what about support groups in the writing community? Are you a member of any group that helps support your writing? I'm not a member of any groups. I do know a few authors who have been super supportive. Um, they're kind of in the same, I guess, up and coming kind of situation that I am. And that's been very helpful. Um, but I find that I'm the kind of person who compares myself very easily. Um, and that's a negative trait. <laughs> so if I'm, if I'm around a lot of people who are, you know, maybe their books are doing a lot better than mine, or some that are doing worse than mine, then I'm immediately thinking, okay, what am I doing wrong? What, are, what are, you know, what's wrong with my book? What's wrong with my writing? What, you know, <laughs> what am I not doing? Um, so it's, if for me, sometimes I need to put myself in a bubble mm -hmm. and just kind of be like, do your own thing, mm -hmm. focus on you because, mm -hmm. you know, what other people are doing doesn't necessarily matter. 
because it's so easy to get to get caught in that mm. and i just i'm yeah. a, i'm a I'm gullible when it comes to that sort of thing. So. <laughs> and put unnecessary pressure on yeah. yourself. Of course. And are, oh, yeah. you, are you also afraid to emulate another author then in your writing? I don't think so because I feel like I developed my own writing style a while ago and I don't really worry about... It's funny though, when I'm actively writing, I don't read any other books. Mm-hmm. Because I'm very, very worried that I will think of something and not remember where that idea came from and just start writing. Mm-hmm. And then like a week later, look back and be like, wait, that sounds just like, so I don't read any books when I'm writing. <laughs> it's like, I take, and if I do, it will be something like a classic from, that's so wildly different from what I'm writing that there's no possible way because I take like plagiarism extraordinarily seriously. Mm-hmm. And that's a mm-hmm. huge fear. So I don't, mm-hmm. I don't engage with any, any other um, writing, but I, I'm not super afraid of that because I feel like if you're able to develop your own style, mm-hmm. I don't think you can break from that. I think it just kind of is like, mm. it's kind of like dialect. It's like, if, if that's how you write, that's going to be how you write. Mm. So it, I think it would be difficult to take, you know, yeah. other, although I think you can use, you can get inspiration. Like for example, um, I read uh, The Five People You Meet in Heaven Mm -hmm. when I was a lot younger. Mm -hmm. And that was my first favorite book. I loved it. And when I read that, it's by Mitch Album. um, I immediately was like, I love this writing style. I love how he is so connected with Mm -hmm. the reader. Mm -hmm. And I decided then, I was like, I want to have a style like this. Mm -hmm. I want to connect with the reader like Mm -hmm. that. So I think there's nothing wrong with reading and and like F. Scott Fitzgerald and how he describes everything so beautifully and vividly. I, I read, I love his books. And, and after I read a few of them, I was like, I want to describe things like he does. So I think taking those different things being like, I want to be as descriptive as this author. And I want to be as personal as this author. I think that's great. As long as you put everything together into your own mm-hmm. style. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, you know. As a non-writer, <laughs> oh, you write shopping lists. Um, I wonder how can one consciously um, develop one's own style? You consciously do it. I think it it has to be organic. I think it just kind of goes through you. And I think it's it's through a lot of trial and error. I think you you will feel if it's wrong. And mm-hmm. it's a very <laughs> yeah, it's a very generic thing to say. But if for example, if I'm writing something, like when I started writing um this story in the third person. It was not right. It felt wrong. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. I didn't know what was wrong at first, but it felt wrong. It did not feel like what I, if I write a sentence and it just does, it's not my normal style for some reason, I immediately, what, wait a second, that's not, <laughs> what? No, that, I delete it. So yeah. I think you, you know, if it's not organic. So I think sometimes you just have to write it out until you hit something that you're like, that's me. Mm-hmm. That is what makes sense for me. Mm-hmm. So you kind of try out different things and... Look what feels the best for you, naturally. Yeah, mm. and you'll hit your stride. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and it it also it's also easier, I think, when you're yeah, I always say when you're in the flow, because yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> when you when you're in the zone and you yeah. just like it's it's very easy because there are some days it is not easy. It mm. just I remember I um I saw an interview with Stephen King once and he said that in his like heyday, because he's written so many yeah. books, it's almost yeah. ridiculous. He <laughs> said that he wrote, I think he said four hours, it was four to six, but I think it was four, four hours every single day continuously. And then he stopped at that four hours. And to me, I'm like, I don't think I could do that because I would put so much pressure on those four hours. What if you're not feeling it during those four hours? Would you just write and just let it, like, I, I don't know, because there are some days where I sit down to write and it's just like, this is not good. Yeah. What is coming out is <laughs> not good right now. So I just need to take a break and come back to it later. But I, I mean, I guess it's all about your creative process and that's his, but I, for some people, it's just that mm. you sit down, you write, and there it is. But you said, kind of that. yeah, but you said you wrote a lot of short stories before you wrote this novel. So do you think that helped you in a way for one to find your voice as an author and yeah. also for your for the writing process as well? Oh yeah, I think that I mean I've written 
tons of poetry, short stories. And I think that helped me, that definitely helped me develop like a defined writing style Mm -hmm. for myself that I didn't, I don't think I would have been able to have if I hadn't exercised it that way. Mm -hmm. Um, Because looking back, it's funny. I recently found a file of writing from college. This was (laughs) from, I guess, wow. Over 10 years ago, uh, more than that now, personally. Um, (laughs) But I found this, this folder of writing and I was like, wow, I've always had the same style. I just Mm -hmm. didn't really notice Mm -hmm. it. Um, and it's, it's cool to see how it's evolved, but also Mm -hmm. not Mm -hmm. because it's like, I've, I think my writing has matured a little Mm -hmm. bit, but the, but the style has been consistent the whole time. And Mm -hmm. that's, I think that's pretty much with every author. If you have that style, it's just going to be there. Mm -hmm. It's kind of like intrinsic to your, to your being. Um, and I think it's kind of cool to see that like the growth, but also the, how linear Mm -hmm. it is. Mm -hmm. And I have to say, in your book, this first person narration, it was done splendidly because it felt very, very relatable and very, very natural being in Odette's head and sharing her thoughts. Yeah, I mean, it, it's great. It really is. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Awesome. <laughs> yeah, it, it, it really is because. Um, like, like I said before, you are there with her. You are in her head. Like you, and also you compared it with um, um, diary writing. Mm-hmm. But you, you feel as if you are at, there at the moment with her. And it's absolutely realistic and absolutely enjoyable and uh, really relatable. And the topic is a difficult topic, like you said, um, um, uh being being with another man, although you are married and so on, um, but when you when you get through the process and you learn about the people, and it's something we should have more often, something relatable, not just I mean nothing against lovey dovey. We we also <laughs> enjoy that as well. But you need it once in a while. Yeah, yeah of <laughs> course we do. But it's also interesting to see mm-hmm. what about the the years after. What about the, the after? Yeah. That's, that makes it so interesting, your book, and also dealing with all kinds of things. Yeah, I think there's so many different things that inform our decisions and who we are as people, mm-hmm. and I wanted to convey that a little bit without mm-hmm. without bogging her down yeah. too much. I also wanted yep. it to be um, to be clear, like, yeah, people people do things because of X, Y, and Z, yep. and um, and I, I I'm so happy to hear that you found it relatable because I mm-hmm. I think I the did. whole point was to to be able to feel like she was talking to you um directly yep. and um like you're that you're that friend because everybody has somebody in their life that just keeps making bad decisions and <laughs> you might be that person you might be the one who's listening but mm-hmm. usually there's the there's the one that's that's listening and, mm-hmm. and you try giving advice and they just it doesn't do anything so eventually you just stop and you just listen mm-hmm. and you're just like okay you know what is it today what did you do now <laughs> um and I think everybody has that relationship mm-hmm. in their life and I think this is the kind of situation where I wanted the reader to be that friend Mm -hmm. who's just like, okay, what did you do today? What is it? (laughs) Let's hear it. Let's just unload. Um, And you just kind of have to watch her life kind of derail a little bit and and come back and then derail and then come back and derail and kind of be powerless to help her, but enjoy the ride a little bit. (laughs) (laughs) Because sometimes you can't help people. You can only watch. Yeah, exactly. Watch the train wreck unfold. Sometimes. And pick up the pieces. Yes. Exactly. Yes. Just be the yeah. friend there and say, okay, come on. Yeah. And and sometimes people yeah. themselves know mm. they're doing the wrong thing, but yep. they're kind of helpless to really change something. Mm. Mm. Yeah, yeah. True. And I think it's it's funny because people, there's some people who are so good at, at helping others and so very bad at helping themselves. And I think Odette is one of those people where she she is so in tune with other people's emotions. But when it comes to herself, mm. she is powerless yep. to like even identify the things that she's doing. Mm. Yeah. So it, I think it's interesting. And I think a lot of people share that trait where they they just are are so very good at, at reading other people and so very bad at reading themselves. Mm. And not following their own advice. Yes. Yep. We spoke about that today, didn't we, Teacup? Yes, yeah. we did. It's not about relationships, but your professional life is some sometimes that way as well. 
isn't it? We're humans in any regard. <laughs> yes, we're not superhumans. And that's what makes yes. her book so good. They are not superhumans, <laughs> they are humans. Hmm? Yes. And may I ask, um, Elena, the publishing of your book, is it indie published? Yeah, so yeah. I published it originally through Barnes and Noble, mm -hmm. then I republished it um, through Amazon and a bunch of mm -hmm. different outlets. Um, I think that's that's probably the most difficult. You asked over the hardest part of writing it. Writing it was easy compared to publishing. <laughs> <laughs> publishing, publishing and marketing it has been a nightmare, but the writing, that was great. And did you offer it to uh, traditional publishing houses or was it uh, your, your intent from the beginning? To be indie, I did um, originally. I think it was early last year. Um, what was last year? Twenty twenty two. Yeah, it was early <laughs> last year um, that I sent it out to a bunch of different publishing mm -hmm. houses. Most I didn't hear it back from. Mm -hmm. um, a couple said no. Most I didn't hear back from. And after several months, I was like, "Why am I doing this? Like, I spent mm -hmm. years working on this. I might as well just get it out there." So mm -hmm. um, I self published it. And it's been, I mean, I've gotten um, some good interest from it and really good reviews, which makes me very happy. Um, it's just very hard because, as I'm sure you know, people don't necessarily want to take a risk on a new author. Mm -hmm. So they're a lot more likely to go for people that they know and have read yeah. for years versus someone that they don't know. Yeah. So that's the hardest part is kind of being like, hey, I promise you won't be disappointed. <laughs> Please just try it. <laughs> Just try it out. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so that, yeah, that's been, that's difficult. Yeah, that's the plus side of our podcast, isn't it, Teacup? Yep. It's discovering new authors, especially indie authors, which we wouldn't have discovered otherwise, I have to say, because they usually yeah. wouldn't pop up on your Amazon search, would they? Mm -hmm. I mean, they wouldn't. I think the thing with the big publishers, uh, also in, 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 in other media outlets like, mm. like films and so on, I think they, because so much money is involved, they always want to make sure, I mean, they can't manage that, but they want to make sure that mm. um, they will get the return on their investment. Yep. Yeah. And so they don't, don't take any chances. Mm. So yeah. you get a lot of the same and the same again, which is nice once in a while, but you often want to have enjoy something different because it gets boring reading the same over exactly. and over again. I agree. And I think so much, so much of it is formulaic and that mm -hmm. upsets me a little bit. And I think as, as someone who reads a ton, but also writes a ton, um, I remember several years ago, someone said to me, well, why don't you just write a vampire novel and get that published? And then you can write whatever you want because you'll have that. Because yes. at that point, oh, that was when like vampires were mm -hmm. like super popular. <laughs> and it's kind of true, but it's also selling out. And it's, it's just, it's kind of frustrating to me when you see There are so many amazing authors, and then there are so many people who copy amazing authors. Yes. And you just read very, very similar stories and very similar storylines. And because it's so commercialized, people just eat it up. Mm. And it doesn't leave any room for the new ideas to yeah. come out. Yeah. And that, I think, is Wait a minute. Wait, wait a minute. I have to ask about the vampires. Um, would you would you like to write a vampire story then? Are you into vampires? Just asking. I'm not personally into vampires. Okay. Just would I write it? Maybe, <laughs> but I'm not into it personally. Okay, maybe zombies. <clears throat> What say again? Zombies, maybe. Zombies? No, absolutely oh, not. Okay. Yep. Okay. Fine. <laughs> so you can quite that. I'm yeah, sorry. Just, um, just I'm ask. Sorry. Just ask him. Yeah, well, I just wanted to say it's it's sometimes it's it's what you see when you go into a bookstore. There are these mm. tables, and books different the tables thing, are um, of the same of the ah. same type. So um, they are yeah. dedicated to one theme. Yeah, but don't the publishers pay f extra for this kind of display? Probably, but I don't know. But it's. Yes. Yeah, I know There's what not you mean. No much, much choice. Yeah. So if you want to, you have to go to the next table and the next because yeah. everything's the same. And it's yeah, I mean, mm. and they, if you it's, bought it something, they will always try to give mm. you something similar. Yeah. And they don't, yep. they don't think that you have different interests. Yeah, it yeah. seems. What? Yeah, and I think that that makes it difficult. And if you look at writing 
from like <clears throat> between even I would say the 19th century and its early 20th century, the stories were so much more unique. Mm. And it was, you really didn't get, with, there are some exceptions, but you really didn't get the same thing twice. Yeah. You had very, very unique storylines and it all felt fresh. Mm-hmm. And I feel like now you have to kind of wade through <laughs> an ocean of the same ideas in order mm-hmm. to get something. Wow. I've never read that before. That's, that's different. Mm-hmm. And I think that's something that we all kind of need to work on is because it's what the consumer wants mm-hmm. and that's why they do it. You know, <laughs> that's, mm-hmm. that's why that happens. But I think if there was an interest in expressed in different ideas, maybe that would help mm-hmm. a little mm-hmm. bit, mm-hmm. but I think we're kind of stuck. Yeah. But I think <laughs> where we are now. Yep. <laughs> it also gets more difficult when you think that the more books that are published, mm. I mean, in the 19th century, There weren't yeah. that many books around. Yeah. The backlog is much sure. larger now. So yep. I think it, even if it's a similar idea, it just has to be done in an interesting way. Yep. Because, yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's true. Reinvent The main ideas yeah. have all been, I guess, yeah, written exactly. before. But a, a fresh a perspective. Fresh pa- package, more yeah. or less. Yep. Yeah, that's great. Yeah. But yeah. they are a little bit afraid of that. Maybe. So, Elena, one question is also important. What would be your advice to any other author out there? Um, I would say whether people read it or not, you should still write it and you should still publish it. <laughs> <laughs> Because I think there were so many times that I kept wondering, well, what if nobody ever reads it? Mm. And I would have uh, my partner now who would say, well, it doesn't matter. Do you yeah. enjoy writing it? And I'll say yes. And so they keep writing. Yeah. So, you know, if, if just do what, what feels right to you. And if if you're worried that nobody's going to read it, they might not ever read it. It might not happen. But if you enjoy writing it, someday somebody is going to look back and be happy that they have that part of you. So mm-hmm. just keep writing. Mm-hmm. And you are not in, into vampires and zombies. We've have, we have, uh, established that. But um, what about <laughs> other other genres? Do you think of ever dipping your toe into another bond? I do. I actually <laughs> never intended on writing a romance novel. Um, never, ever, ever. Um, I was actually actively against it, but <laughs> this happened. <laughs> this happened, and now the, I'm writing the sequel. But absolutely, I would love to get into horror a little bit. Um, I love sci-fi, so I'd like to get into that. Mm-hmm. Um mm-hmm. So I have tons of ideas. I just don't have enough time to write them all right now. So I'm just doing one at a time. Um, but absolutely, I would. Mm-hmm. The only thing that I really am not, I don't think I'm going to try for the next several years is fantasy. Mm-hmm. But everything else I'll, I'll mm-hmm. get into. Mm-hmm. Why not fantasy? Because I feel like there's already been so much mm-hmm. done that I don't okay. think I would have an original enough idea. Mm-hmm. Okay. If I were to wake up and have an idea that I'm sure no one's done, I'll write it. But for <laughs> now... There's nothing that I could think of that has not been done already. Mm-hmm. So I don't want to redo something else. Mm-hmm. The other stuff I can kind of think of, okay, well, I don't think anybody's ever done that before, but I don't want to, you know. Rehash. I don't want to, mm. yes. Yeah. Mm. I mean, because if you don't have an idea, you tend to um, pick something up from somewhere else and reuse that mm. in a way. Mm. Probably, yeah. Yeah, probably. So that also brings us to the question about your plans. I mean, you've touched a little bit about the sequel you are Mm -hmm. planning or writing already and what else is there in your book for the future so i am yes i'm writing the sequel now um i'd like to maybe make it into like a trilogy Mm because i can see it kind of being a series Mm -hmm. um and then i'd like to after that's um complete i would like to do a collection of short stories and that would be fun Mm because it's not something that's done as much as it used to be and I love short mm-hmm. stories mm-hmm. um we'll see if I can get back into writing them without making it into enough <laughs> my third verse <laughs> problem that I have before um but yeah I've got a ton of ideas and I guess at this point just cranking them out and getting them published and mm-hmm. yeah mm-hmm. yeah we keep our fingers crossed from across the pond as well and I have to say writing maybe three books after you said mm, I don't know if you can write a novel It's quite a long story. Mm. So there were enough ideas for yep. you. Yeah. 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 You shouldn't have worried. Okay. No. 
Absolutely <laughs> not. Absolutely <laughs> not. So, Elena, is there anything else you would like to share, you would like our listeners to know? I would say if there's anything, I would say whether it's me or any other new indie authors, I would say just please, if you're going to buy two books this month, maybe make one of them an author you've never heard of. Um, or even something like if, if budget's an issue, maybe do a Kindle, an Amazon Kindle, you know, one of those very inexpensive books and just try it out and see and support somebody who's, this is literally, this is their blood, sweat and tears that have <laughs> gone into this. So um, I would just encourage people to try um, and support an, an indie author. Mm. We absolutely agree. There's yeah. a lot to be discovered out there. Interesting stories, good stories, fascinating stories, dear listeners. So, Elena, thank you so much for joining us. It was a pleasure talking to you. Thank you. I had a lot of fun. I appreciate it. <laughs> You're most good. welcome. It was our pleasure. Thank you. You did enjoy this episode as much as we did? Then hit subscribe and don't miss the next episode. Also, make sure to follow us on Twitter, Facebook and Instagram. If you like to support us and buy us a coffee, you can do so via Buy Me Coffee and other platforms. You can find all the necessary links in the description. Until next time.